As a district manager for the BC Forest Service, I live and work in this area. The decisions I make affect the well-being of this forest land and this community. And that affects the well-being of my friends, my neighbors, and my family. One of the more serious problems I have to deal with is weeds. Plants that interfere with the trees and the forage crops that we're trying to grow. In BC, weeds have seriously reduced the growth of crop trees on more than a million hectares of once productive forest land. On rangeland, knapweed weed has infested up to 85,000 hectares. There are many ways of dealing with weeds. Some methods work better on some sites than on others. When my staff and I assess the weed problem, we look at all the options. Frequently, we find that the best method involves the use of herbicides. Still, only about one-tenth of one percent of the district that I manage requires a herbicide application in a year. There are several methods of applying herbicides. They can be sprayed from the air or from the ground, injected into stems, or applied with a spot gun. We do most of our aerial spraying from helicopters. This technique is used to cover large areas or areas that are not very accessible by land. With the proper herbicide and appropriate timing, aerial spraying is very effective. It controls weeds with a minimum of disturbance to the site and it's not very costly. Note that the leaves receive only a fine spray. They are not drenched with herbicides as some people mistakenly think. For the applicator, Aerial spraying is one of the safest methods of applying herbicide. But aerial spraying can also affect some non-target plants. And it's restricted near streams or lakes where pesticide-free zones are required. Other methods of applying herbicides may be used closer to water, but not within pesticide-free zones. Backpack herbicide sprayers are useful for small areas or spot treatments of low-growing scattered weeds. Power hoses can be used to reach taller vegetation or mobile hydraulic sprayers used to cover large areas. Stem injection of herbicides is just that. An opening is created in the tree's bark and the herbicide is injected into the inner bark. It's a very selective method of controlling large weed species. For herbicides that need to be applied to the soil, we use a spot gun. The herbicide passes through the soil and into the roots of the plant. No matter what method we use, herbicides are applied according to label instructions and strict federal and provincial regulations. These regulations were established to protect the applicators, the public, the environment, fish, wildlife, and domestic livestock. For instance, we do not spray in winds over 8 kilometers per hour. That's to prevent the herbicides from drifting beyond the target area. We also control drift during aerial spraying by regulating the droplet size and by flying low over the area to be treated. To minimize evaporation, we apply spray when the temperature is less than 25 degrees and the relative humidity is above 50%. To control any herbicide that may move through or across the ground, we may leave a buffer zone around areas with steep terrain, drainage channels, or loose soil. We also identify streams, rivers, and lakes for special protection. A minimum 10-meter pesticide-free zone is marked around bodies of water, including water used for irrigation, for fisheries, and for human consumption. An additional buffer zone may be added to these pesticide-free zones to ensure control of any herbicide residues. When we're about to treat an area, we keep people at a safe distance. We make sure the roads are blocked. Herbicide application signs are posted and remain on site for at least six months. We make sure no one is in the area before treatment begins. Sometimes we reschedule our applications of herbicides to protect wildlife, such as nesting birds. Sometimes we reschedule to protect forage for wildlife or domestic livestock. Applicators of herbicides in the forests and on the rangeland are trained,
tested and certified. Or they must be closely supervised by someone who is certified. Of course, applicators only use herbicides that have been extensively tested, approved, and registered by the federal government. Applicators must also apply for permits in order to use herbicides. The permits are issued by the Pesticides Control Branch, BC Ministry of Environment and Parks. The permits are site-specific in nature and cover treatment restrictions such as dosage rates, buffer zones, and timing of application of the herbicides. Public information centers have been established in each forest district to provide a wide range of information on herbicides, their application, and other forestry practices. And then I'll get one of our resource assistants to help you also. Good, thanks a lot. District staff are available to discuss the questions that the public may have. The permit process also recognizes the rights of the public. Any individual or group may appeal the granting of a permit through the Environmental Appeal Board. When the Forest Service holds a permit, a staff member who is knowledgeable and experienced in forestry is responsible to see that the herbicide is applied according to both permit and label instructions. And the certified applicator is responsible for applying it correctly. Applicators are also required to wear protective clothing. This applicator is outfitted for backpack spraying. Applicators are also required to use safe work habits. For instance, they check the operation of their equipment and inspect it for leaks. They work under close supervision. They wash well after applying herbicides. For emergencies, first aid kits, water and eye wash facilities are available. When work crews are large, an industrial first aid attendant is on hand. Although we've never had a spill, we are fully prepared. Applicators are required to control, absorb, and neutralize the herbicide with materials such as lime, activated charcoal, or soil. All contaminated materials from a spill would be disposed of at a site approved by the pesticide control branch. If a large spill ever occurred, we would call in a specialist from the pesticide control branch. We may also consult with a representative from the manufacturer of the herbicide. Of course, the safe use of herbicides also extends to its safe storage. Herbicides are kept in ventilated, temperature-regulated buildings that are locked and marked with warning signs. Water and food are kept well away from these buildings. Oil, gas, and explosives are also stored apart from herbicides. Herbicides are stored tightly sealed in their original containers, with the labels clearly visible. A close check is kept on inventory. Empty herbicide containers and contaminated materials, such as an applicator's gloves and overalls, are disposed of at sites approved by the pesticide control branch. The controlled risks of using herbicides are well chosen when they help avoid major losses like this. When herbicides are applied correctly, the results are impressive. They give valuable conifers a chance to flourish before other plants move back in. Just look at the results. Still, our most important consideration in selecting and using herbicides is safety to people, to fish and wildlife, and to the environment in general. For more information on the safe application of herbicides, contact the forest district manager in your area or the BC Forest Service Silviculture Branch in Victoria.